Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with a midweek update in the world of cannabis. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos and then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you're ready. But we're gonna start with a bit of Canopy news and they did release their Q3 earnings this morning and while the results were not great, especially compared to other Canadian LPs even, especially to US MSOs, I think it is a positive takeaway for the cannabis sector overall that they are up 5.2% in pre-market as of 9, 11 a.m. Uh, while I'm recording this. But I also just wanted to show this to zoom out sort of what we can anticipate in the US because we know how undervalued these US MSOs are. And if you can see, it's September 7th, 2018. Canopy was worth over 50 US dollars a share. And so I just want to do a little quick exercise with you. So if we look down here and see the market cap of 3.82 billion Canadian dollars, that represents the total value of Canopy when the share price is $7.69. Now let's just make this easy and round up from $7.69 to $10. And let's just say that when Canopy is worth $10, it's an equivalent of a $4 billion market cap, just to make that simple, okay? And so if we were to take Canopy's share price and go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, that means in 2018, when Canopy was making a fraction of the money that they're losing right now, and this would have been a month after Constellation Brands invested $5 billion into them, if we were to take a $4 billion market cap at $10 and extrapolate that times five, then you would have a $20 billion market cap in 2018 when Canopy was making, who knows, maybe 40 to 50 million a quarter. And we're gonna see that they're not doing a whole lot better than that, but just wanted to show you for context is how big do you think the MSOs can get market cap wise? I don't think it's out of the question that once they get uplisting that we would see them rise above $20 billion market cap, especially since the MSOs are making far more money than the Canadian LP counterparts. So just wanted to share with that to provide a little bit of context. But as we jump into the numbers, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going through this because these financial numbers are not great. And obviously I've spent a lot of time trying to show you the difference between Canadian LPs and US MSOs and the growth and value that they are each going to see going forward. But just to highlight reported, their net revenue for the third quarter fiscal 2022 financial results was 140 or 141 million. But from my understanding that the estimates was 138. So at least they beat their estimates, which is, might, might see why we see some green pre-market. While this doesn't even compare to Q2 of 2022, which would have been last quarter, this is looking at Q3 of 2021, which means year over year, their revenue has decreased 8%. So if you want to be a market share leader in Canada, a country with such a low population, this is not the way to do it. While their gross margin percentage is just 7%, down 9 900 basis points, their adjusted gross margin percentage, 13%, down 1,300 basis points. They suffered a net loss of 115.5 million, what's new with Canopy, while their adjusted EBITDA or earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization was negative 67.4. However, the estimate was negative 65 million. So at least they were close on that and likely because of that and they beat the revenue by let's say 3 million, that might be why we are actually seeing some green. But besides that, free cash flow as well, they lost 168.3 million. So I would advise you to go through this just to learn more about companies that you don't want to invest in and what their financial statements will look like. Because in the past, in 2018, obviously we did not know what Canopy would become, but as we can see, a lot of their investments did not pan out. And sadly, shareholders are left holding the bag. So back to the U.S. market, as this comes from the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation, as Illinois Adult Use Cannabis Monthly sales figures have come out for the month of January in 2022. Selling 2.6 million items for in-state resident sales of 81.9 million, out-of-state resident sales of 35.2 million, for total sales of 117.2 million. And while this is a significant drop from the December record that they set, 137.8 million, and obviously that's people spending for the holidays and getting prepared, it's, it's totally reasonable to assume and, and plausible that if you spent so much in December, you likely had cannabis in January, you didn't need to go back to the store, or you just didn't go back to spend as much because you bought so much the month before. And so I do anticipate that February is going to be a jump up from this amount, uh, but worth pointing out that items sold 2.6 million is the least amount, at least since summer of last year, um, but worth reminding you that Illinois at some point did award over 100 new licenses. And while they haven't been approved for the license holders to start setting up shop, and I don't know why that is, they should be approved at some point in the future and that will open up at least 100 more license shops. And from my understanding, it's either 85 or 100 or 185. I don't know exactly the number offhand, but there's a lot more licenses Illinois in Illinois to come 
once they finally get approved to open up and get that going. So obviously those will contribute to more sales, but nonetheless, good to see strong sales across the board to start the year. And so on to this one from MJ Biz Daily. Just wanted to highlight that flour still is king in the US cannabis market, though their supremacy is waning as new products are coming online. So flour growth and pricing in 2021, sales of cannabis flour in 2021 rose less than sales of all MJ products in California, Colorado, Michigan, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. While flour prices were also down almost $1 per gram. So obviously, this is good to see as com competition is causing the price to go down, which is making it cheaper for consumers. If we take a look, we can see sales growth year over year from 2020. And while the total market was 18.4%, flour just 11.5%. Looking at flour growth by product category year over year from 2020, we can see how much uh, more people purchase versus less, um, showing where trends are heading. And then as we can see, the flower price is going down. But just wanted to highlight this as it's good to see that flower is still popular, but um, especially in the US with the looser regulations than we have in Canada, at least, people are more uh, encouraged to try different products and it seems like they're not regretting it. And so on to some other news from states, booming Missouri medical cannabis industry bets on full legalization in 2022. Love to hear that as Missouri medical cannabis sales are climbing and thousands of workers have flocked to the industry. Now business owners are betting big on full legalization in in 2022. Now, again, though, keep in mind, this is business owners betting big. If, I, if I've learned any lesson over the past few years, do not bet on legislation before it happens. But mind you, it's positive to say that we think the market will go up three or four times if full legalization passes, said Mark Hendren, president of Flora Farms. We hope that and we expect that and just looking at what's happened in other markets. And obviously this helps to add that BD Health Ventures, owner of Florida, has given 250,000 to the most plausible path to full legalization this year in Missouri, Legalize Missouri 2022, which is gathering signatures to place a proposed constitutional change on the November 8th ballot. That includes two contributions totaling 215,000 it made last month record show. So while this is great to see that this will likely be on the ballot, and I imagine that voters are gonna overwhelmingly approve yes, Obviously, what we've seen is how quickly can Missouri go from voting for it to actually implementing it, hopefully quickly. And obviously, if all the businesses involved and the regulators involved are on the same page as the businesses, sooner than later would be ideal. But that's great for Missouri. While pot cafes could soon be coming to Massachusetts, this comes from the Boston Herald. So just wanted to touch a bit on this as we did see the precedent set or the precedent set in California and Nevada. It's good to see the first of this showing up in the East. As back in 2016, Massachusetts voters approved a ballot measure that would allow the option for municipalities to bring cannabis cafes or social consumption sites to town where people can gather and use cannabis together Amsterdam style. Now what's not to like about that? If we've got bars for booze, we should have cafes for cannabis. Now over half a decade later, the legislative move has inched the state closer to making them a reality. While the cafes have not begun popping up in the Bay State because of a legal technicality, go figure, that prevented cities and towns from being able to vote to bring these cafes within their borders, last week the state's legislature's Joint Committee on Cannabis Policy favorably reported out a bill that would clear that blockage as well as tightening restrictions on contracts between cannabis businesses and host communities and creating a cannabis social equity trust fund. So just wanted to provide this update from Massachusetts. Obviously soon could mean a year based on Schumer's terms, but while this is good to see see uh, trends that we saw out west in mature markets coming to the east and at least being welcomed and considered. So, uh, and then also in Pennsylvania, we got the Senate committee holds first ever hearing on legalizing recreational cannabis. This is a great update out of Pennsylvania. And we do hope that we'll see some more efforts or at least see this on the ballot for 2022. For the first time ever, a Pennsylvania Senate committee held a legislative hearing on the possible legalization of recreational cannabis. So that is progress. State senators heard from law enforcement officials, including York County District Attorney Dave Sunday and the Chief County Detective in Dauphin County. Well, it's worth noting Pennsylvania Senator Mike Reed a Republican. So it's good to see this effort again out of a Republican in Pennsylvania who represents part of parts of York and Cumberland counties, chairs the committee, and has expressed interest in crafting a bill to legalize recreational cannabis. Adding Regan is hoping to convince fellow Republicans to back a bill he's drafting with Rep. Amen Brown. And some of these reasons, well, it certainly produces a product that's a lot safer than what's out there in the black market. And obviously with these proceeds, you can tax them and focus on funding after school programs and summer camps and things of that nature. So it's great to see Republicans, Republicans coming around and seeing the benefits of ending cannabis programs. So onto this one from Tom Engel. Uh, you can grab the link below if you want to read the article. I'm not going to get through it because I just have too many stories and it'll be too much time. But the fact is that ongoing police seizures of cash being transported from licensed cannabis businesses to banks has led to federal litigation, which we love to see as companies are fighting back and taking this to the Supreme Court over the repeated and continuing highway robberies of armored cars by, you guessed it, government agents, which screams why safe is so important for the small business owners and minority entrepreneurs, not only for them to just get a start and lower access to 
to capital so they can begin in this industry, but to protect them from predatory government agents abusing their power, using government funds to go after legal cannabis businesses in legal states and try and seize their cash, which is nothing short of criminal. Which brings me to the next point. So thank you, Synergy Candle Life, for highlighting that. While McConnell didn't blast safe banking when it was added to the NDAA because he knew Schumer would pull it, the only reason he's getting vocal now is because he wants it pulled, likely because there's a lot more Republican support for safe or any cannabis bill than McConnell could have imagined. So while Synergy Life says, Schumer, don't back down now. Thank you for that effort. I love that Boris chimes in, even despite the typo here. It's not about Schumer on this one as it is about Pelosi not backing down. And while I'm not sure why that's true, if Boris says it, he knows a lot more than I do. If she stands behind it, the Senate has no choice but to support it. So consider writing Pelosi in support of SAFE, staying in the legislation, which from my understanding is the America Competes Act. Um, and so that way, or what, how we can do this, contact Nancy Pelosi to express your support for SAFE banking in the I think it's the America Competes Act. I don't know if it's the CARES Act, but regardless, this is her phone number, her email, and her mail. And this is just an example. And so thank you, Christopher Norman, for sharing your template as a reference, because obviously it doesn't have to be long. You want it to be short and sweet as it's more effective that way, but you want it to be honest and sincere and to the point. And if you can, share a little bit of how you arrived at that point. And so he does a good job of that. This one referencing the article that I mentioned previously, but also another example of some absurdity he saw in Tennessee. And so while I'm not American, if I was, I would be phoning and emailing, <laughs> you know, all day. Um, obviously, if Boris Jordan, who's working closely with lobbyists and those in the cannabis industry, says that we need to put the pressure on Pelosi. Well, time to put the pressure on, especially to help the momentum keep building. And so I wanted to share this one from Pawchalk, as it's great to see Justin Streakle, who used to work with Normal, obviously a pro-cannabis organization that's been doing a lot of work over the years. He has started a new cannabis-focused PAC. And so this PAC formed to defeat cannabis prohibitionists in Congress. So again, love to see more people coming together to fight this cause and end prohibition once and for all. It is time to take the gloves off when it comes to addressing the minority of members of Congress who are standing in the way of common sense efforts to end the senseless and cruel policy of cannabis criminalization, said Bullpack founder Justin Striegel. What we love to hear is it highlights that much like Canada, these small fringe minority views are actually coming from within the political parties and they don't represent the silent majority anymore. And so onto this one, a few updates from MSOs as Cresco Labs announces 15th Florida Sunnyside store opening in North Miami. So they're happy to announce that Sunnyside North Miami located at 505 Northeast 125th Street is Cresco Labs' first location in Miami-Dade County, their 15th store in Florida and 49th dispensary nationwide as the company's upcoming Lady Lake store will be its 50th in the U.S. as they are thrilled to welcome North Miami patients to Sunnyside Retail Experience for the first time as they continue to execute and expand in open states while True Leaf to open Florida Riverview uh, Dispensary on Thursday, February 10th, which is tomorrow, as this dispensary will open at 9 a.m. on Thursday, February 10th, becoming True Leaf's 112th dispensary in Florida and 161st nationwide. So good job, True Leaf, as you continue to execute while they also plan to unveil expansive Florida product release lineup for February. As they announced the Florida launch of two proprietary brands, Sweet Talk and Momenta, new Cultivator Collection flower releases, and the second product drop of Live Diamonds by Muse. And so you can pause to read to learn more about the product introductions that are coming in February, but I do see this as a smart long-term play because Truly is focusing on brand. They're coming up with innovative products that you can only get through their brand. And so if this is effective in helping keep market share um, and find products that are gonna sell better in other dispensaries across the country, seems like a smart play uh, and a good way to focus on brand because in the long run, brand always ends up winning. And so some other tweets, just wanted to share this. Um, this one comes from Pierre Gilles, built off of the data from CC Invest. So thank all of you for putting this together. But I just wanted to share this as when I do share the uh, Office of Medical Cannabis Use from Florida every single week. Um, and when I say that you can put this into a spreadsheet or just look week over week and compare whether uh, MSOs are increasing or decreasing their market share. While I'm not a spreadsheet guy, other people are. And so this is sort of the exact thing that you can do with that data. Um, and so just wanted to share this because it does highlight um, just sort of the breakdown of the top MSOs, at least in Florida, True Leaf Liberty Health Sciences owned by Air Wellness, AltMed Florida owned by Verano, Cure Leaf, and then Sertera Wellness, which I think is the parent co or... Uh, or consortium. I think it's consortium, not the parent co. But nonetheless, this is exactly sort of what I'm talking about. So you might not be able to see the bottom corner, but this is an example of how you could take that data, put it into a spreadsheet, and calculate over time um, and see how the market share is playing out. So nonetheless, truly certainly keeps number one, but this fight is getting competitive between the other MSOs. So that's super interesting to see how this will happen in the long run, especially when Florida legalizes for adult use. But you can grab all these links below as well. Um, and so just wanted to share a bunch of these snippets as more and more are coming out. And you know, while we're sort of in the lull period, but we are seeing more um, 
more green days than red, which is obviously beneficial based on the last year that we've gone through. The more data that we can compare uh, and help us make better decisions and plan accordingly, uh, I, I think the better. So I wanted to share this one from Dennis Rudev again, who appears to be a fund manager for Hadron Healthcare Fund looking for alternative and healthcare investments or alternative healthcare investments. He adds, Cowan update on Safe Banking Act. There's always a risk. It's not about the risk I would, his personal view in this circumstances say, it's about risk versus reward. And when cannabis starts going legal in any form, might be a bit too late to get in for the potential massive returns as this move was not expected. So I'm not going to read through the whole thing. Actually, let me just share this so you can pause to read if you want, um, but a little bit more info in here. And so obviously it's more just speculation, more perspectives, but it's it's more information that you can compare to what you already know to help you make better uh, investment decisions going forward. And so this is another one from Dennis Rudev. His cannabis might well become quite decent, safe, and capital protection investment. At least the numbers are telling that. And so I wanted to share this one um, from 8 Capital, enterprise value divided by EBITDA versus growth. And so if we want to compare US MSOs, uh, represented by the American flag in the circle here, compared to tobacco. It seems like right now, tobacco is actually trading at a lower enterprise value divided by EBITDA for 2022 revenue estimates than MSOs, but like, let's say 8x to 8.5x or 7x to 9x would be the idea. However, as we can see, MSOs do have a much higher percentage growth uh, of EBITDA or anticipated percentage growth of EBITDA in the coming years than tobacco companies do versus all of these companies, which are already trading valuation wise at much higher multiples, not even bringing in uh, the amount of growth that MSOs are. The only ones that can compete with the growth, obviously, are tech. Um, but so this, I think, is what presents the MSOs as such an opportunity. And this is a, a very good way to zoom out and remind us where we are, even over the past year, because things have moved very quickly, um, especially you know, Biden winning the White House. That was only a year ago. And where we seem to be right now, the introduction of draft legislation. Bills like the CAOA and the SRA demonstrate the momentum behind reform efforts. While the bills would join the already introduced SAFE and MORE Act for deliberation in Congress, but the next steps that are to come is obviously some progress out of here. And while we're not likely to see progress anytime soon, we have heard Schumer say he's going to make it a priority to introduce the CAOA. Obviously, it's going to be dead on arrival. And then from there, we're going to see what we can work with. But obviously, this is better than what we've seen for the last few years. And price is just dropping despite fundamentals improving. And so a few others from Todd Harrison. This one is Jeffries on cannabis. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just to touch a little bit on uh, the Pelosi aspect. This week, in addition to safe passing the House, we understand Pelosi will now advocate for in conference. Schumer held a press conference discussing plans for his bill, and Republican Senator Joyce held a conference with the main safe sponsor, talking about a critical inflection point with cannabis policy. And so I think just that adds that other politicians are seeing the benefits of this, um, and especially that it's very popular among the American people. So obviously now is more exciting than ever for this industry as we look forward into you know, a very nice setup into 2022. And so obviously this is the rest of the snippet if you want to read it and pause to read. Well, this comes from AGP on cannabis. Safe passes house for the sixth time, but Senator Schumer keeps focus on CAOA for now. So I'm not going to read this one, but pause to read if you want to. Um, and then we've got this one from Roth on U.S. Cannabis from Todd Harrison. So thank you, Todd, for sharing these all as well. Weekly rehash, converting states medical to adult use, a coming catalyst. And so I'm not going to read this whole one, but just wanted to touch on this last snippet. 2020, your 2020 and 2021 industry sales were driven by Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania as primarily new states, both medically and recreationally. The next sector catalyst is the approved adult use state conversions. New Jersey estimated Q2 of 2022, uh, Connecticut Q4 of 2022, New Mexico second half of 2022. Actually, that's going to be April 1st, so that's not even second half. New York, first half of 2023, and Virginia, 2022 or 2023 potentially. So expect when this happens, 2x to 4x state cannabis sales pick up on the first year after convert, which we love to hear and highlighting that this really is a when, not if situation. It just requires patience in order to be rewarded. Well, this one is Roth on safe banking uh, as well. U.S. federal cannabis policy update, safe and uplisting biggest sector catalyst. So you can pause to read this one if you want. And then lastly, this one from Camilo on U.S. Cannabis from BTIG. And the question has definitely changed from if to when. Well, it was always that, um, but he adds odds of federal cannabis reform are dramatically improving. And so while you can pause to read if you want to read all of the what you should know and CAOA revived from BTIG's perspective, uh, there's also this section, are safe and CAOA mutually exclusive, exclusive, and are we close on New Jersey? So I'm just going to read this New Jersey snippet. While we eagerly await confirmation on when the rec program will commence, we are hearing more positive chatter about our industry contacts that the program could start at the end of March. Boom, that's 
consistent with what we heard on uh, on the weekend. We should hear more definitive news on the matter over the next two to three weeks when the New Jersey Commission next meets. This would be positive catalyst for the stocks expect, exposed to the states as they have been waiting for over six months for the program to start. And they are prepared to supply the uh, demand legally. So it's just a matter of time. And we love to hear that. It could be as soon as March. And so lastly, this one from Tyler Neville, the total market cap of publicly traded large cap U.S. multi-state operators is ballpark 30 to 40 billion. And Ricky Sandler, who's a, apparently a fund manager, runs 8 billion alone. The penetration of institutional money into MSOs as of right now is still just 4% compared to many other industries, which is up to 15 to 20%. If this poses them to ask the question, I've asked you many times, and we just love to see that more money managers are coming to the same conclusion that, is this the best risk reward in investing right now? And I do agree, especially he says this in reference to Ricky Sandler, who he references runs 8 billion alone, tweeting on February 5th that global cannabis sales will 5X. And while he seems to be focused on global, I'm just focused on the US. I'm not gonna look at Germany, at least until they pass a bill and launch an adult use program. For now, my eyes are on the US, but I just wanted to present this to highlight that more money managers are coming to the same conclusion. And with that, I wanted to share this resource from at cashflow underscore free uh, on Twitter. I would recommend following him if you can, but this is his amazing comp sheet highlighting current MSOs at their value right now. This is as of Monday, February 7th though. So it wouldn't account for the last few days, but this is as of Monday highlighting their total accumulative market cap for tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four. Um, and then their enterprise value, which would be their actual value if you uh, subtracted all liabilities from their current assets. Um, but then it goes across the board to highlight their fact set sales estimates for 2020 all the way to 2023 and their compounded annual growth rates, um, their fact set EBITDA estimates based on any publicly available data he can get, their EBITDA margins, their earnings per share, their enterprise value divided by sales, their enterprise value divided by EBITDA, and their price to earnings ratio for those that's like the generally accounted accepting principles. Highlights the stores, uh, the net debt, fully diluted shares outstanding as well, their, and their current share prices. Again, though, as of Monday. So I would just ask, or I would recommend that you just favorite this and keep this on hand. And But obviously you can go to Twitter and follow him and get his up-to-date version. Uh, but just wanted to share this because it's, it's just a beautiful resource uh, comp sheet. And if you don't understand what you're looking at, try and take some time to learn what you're looking at. Very valuable information in here. Um, and so again, the best bang for your buck though, at least this is not advice, just my opinion, would be the tier ones as they certainly have the biggest reach, uh, the best balance sheets and the best ability to grow from here. Uh, nonetheless, lots of good information on here. You can spend a lot of time. So lastly, a few stories to share as seniors are using cannabis more than ever before. And we love to highlight this, uh, but it's not a big jump. <laughs> as cannabis use is on the rise among older adults. Okay, fair enough. How much? In 2021, the proportion of adults 65 or older who reported recent cannabis use jumped by 18%, according to the 2020 National Drug Service survey or national survey of drug use and health released in November rising from 5.1% in 2019 to 6%. And so that 18% represents the increase from 5.1% of adults or older adults versus 6% of older adults. And honestly, I think the more adults that consume cannabis, uh, the more happy some of these older adults would be because obviously it has a lot of benefits for pain and for certain things that they might not see it as beneficial for yet. But nonetheless, uh, in time, I think this will increase, obviously. And so the spike comes on the heels of a steady trend of increased cannabis use among seniors over the past five years probably a lot of them turning to a safer non-addictive medicinal alternative. And what's more in 2020, more adults also report using cannabis sometime in their lifetime, a jump from roughly 32 to 36%, signaling a possible culture shift in older adults' willingness to open up about past tokes. And so obviously this is likely also just because for the last five years, they've actually been tracking this, where before they weren't tracking it. This also likely just signals 4% more people are willing to be honest than they might've been in the past too. It's hard to say, but nonetheless, good to see that this is trending in that direction. While Green Market Reports highlights that female cannabis consumption keeps growing as well. So data from Headset, uh, January data from Headset report shows that female cannabis consumers are on a continued ascend in the U.S., increasing 55% from Q1 2020 to Q4 2021. This growing consumer demographic is even more robust in Canada, where both Gen Z and millennial females posted even higher sales than in the U.S. In fact, female Canadian consumers contributed to 36.7% of cannabis spending in Q4 2021, which is 4.1% higher than in the U.S. While consumption among males has also grown, albeit at a smaller percentage than females, while the female market share has increased notably over the past two years, which reflects that the statistic that only a third of total cannabis sales are currently to women is changing at a brisk rate, which is great to see because as it's God's plant and a very beneficial tool, uh, if you can use it in moderation, good to see more women opening up much like senior adults. And in time, we imagine that this consumption rate is also going to increase. Well, lastly, just wanted to share this amazing study as active ingredient in cannabis protects aging brain cells. Huh? 
Uh, look at the amazing things we find when we can actually study this plant, which is why we need to deschedule the damn thing. As just wanted to share the snippet, decades of research on medical cannabis has focused on the compounds THC and CBD in clinical applications. These are the main ones we know about because this is what we've been able to find through the few studies. But less is known about the therapeutic properties of cannabinol, CBN, which is another compound we have found to have medical benefits. Now, a new study by Salk scientists shows how CBN can protect nerve cells from oxidative damage, a major pathway to cell death. Wow, that seems like very beneficial news. The findings published online January 6, 2022 in the journal Free Radical Biology and Medicine. So you can grab that link. Uh, this link will be below, but this is the link to the actual study if you want to grab it. Suggests that CBN has a potential for treating age-related neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. This is again sort of why I reference it'd be better for more adults to start consuming because these are the sort of things that they might not know about. Um, and just by using cannabis as a tool in moderation in their daily life, it could go a long way to helping, uh, you know, restore their cognitive function and, and other side effects. So nonetheless, just wanted to share this as this is a great finding. And again, more reason to deschedule so we can find all of the other medical benefits. I uh, lastly just wanted to share another interesting infograph from the Visual Capital, a bird's eye view of the world's largest cannabis markets. And so this is an interesting read through. Uh, it looks at North America and Europe and how they have sort of evolved over time and what we can anticipate going forward. Um, so it's very interesting, especially if you're interested in this industry and you see this industry being as big as, it, as I do at least, because obviously those that don't understand how you can use the compounds for much greater purposes might not see how it can be so big and how it can be used as ingredients in foods um, and skincare products, uh, even shampoo and conditioner, different things like that. Um, nonetheless, it just sort of shows where we're at now but it might help you sort of, you know, expand your horizons and be able to see how just global this will go once the U.S. decides to end prohibition and decide that, oh yeah, cannabis is actually medicine as it always has been all along. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos and I will catch you on Sunday for this week in cannabis investing news. Have a great week, everybody.